Hi, I'm Justin Hill, Assistant Pastor here at Liberty, and I want to take a minute to welcome you to our services today. Members, thank you for your faithfulness. If you're visiting with us, you are our honored guest, and we are so glad that you chose to worship with us today. Our ushers have a guest registration card just for you. Please be sure to fill that out so that we have record of your visit. We're glad that you're here. I hope you've all come prayed up and expecting a blessing because as we meet together in God's house, his presence will meet with us and we will be forever changed. our Savior this morning. Amen. If you're thankful for the love of Christ, let me hear you say amen. Your love so great, Jesus in all things. I've seen a glimpse of your heart.
another, let's go ahead and take this moment to walk around and greet each other in the house of the Lord with a holy handshake, a faithful fist bump, or a heavenly hug. funny is we do this intro song while everybody shakes hands. Well, two weeks ago, we did that one for the first time, the praise is the offering. And when we practiced it for the first time, Don said, that's way too short. Everybody will still be shaking hands when you get done with it. So this week, I added a chorus to that song, and y'all are still shaking hands while we're singing. Y'all... <laughs> It's all the love. It's all the love. It, no, it was choose one of the three. Yeah, yeah, you don't shake, bump, and hug. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, you, you pick one. Pick one, okay? <laughs> all right. Has anybody got your memory verses memorized yet? No hands yet. Okay. Well, we have this Sunday and next Sunday, and that's it, right? No, we have two Sundays. Oh, we got this Sunday and two more Sundays. This is a five Sunday month, all right? So you got a little bit more time to work on your memory verses. It's a great, great four verses. Let's recite them together. Ephesians 4, 29, 30, 31, and 32. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Amen. We always end on that verse. And because we end on it, that's kind of our focus as we come out of the memory verses. Matt, go back to the first verse, verse 29. Man, if we could get that verse right there, we would live in a lot better place. Would we not? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Or in the 2018 King James Version, we could put proceed out of your mouth or on your phone, on your fingertips, your computer. Let no no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. I learned something a few years back. Before I send a text message, before I call someone, before I post something on social media, I read it at least three times because I want to know that what's coming out of my mouth or coming across my screen is not corrupt communication, but that which is for the use of edifying the body of Christ. Amen? So as you work on your memory verses this week, I want you to really focus on that first verse. 
And if we can grasp that as a church, we could change this church, we could change this city, this state, this country, and the world for Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, as I said at the start of the service, if you're thankful for the love of God, let me hear you say amen. Amen, amen so am I. send your son Jesus to the cross for us. It amazes me every time I think about it. The fact that when I look at my life, the times that I've brought shame to your name, the times that I've chosen wrong over right, I don't deserve a savior. But you saw me as worthy and you sent your son Jesus to die in my place 
so that I could have a relationship with you. And God, that love, oh, what love, fierce love. Thank you for the love that you carried with you to the cross.
morning. That's so beautiful. I'm listening to you guys sing right now, and I hear a room full of people that are thinking about that day. If you're not, I want you to take just a second with me. I've got my eyes closed because that's the easiest way to be free of distractions and to see with spirit eyes. I want you to imagine that event that we're talking about. He shall return in robes of white, the book of Revelation says. The blazing sun will pierce the night. Up up to that point, the world is in total darkness. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, steps foot on the earth, and the blazing sun pierces the night. I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. You know what that means? That means I'm staring into the face of Jesus and nothing else is pulling my focus away. Nothing else is getting my eyes attention but the face of Jesus. He shall return in robes of white. Think about it. The blazing sun shall pierce the night. of Jesus Christ. God, we feel your presence in this room right now. Every day I feel your spirit dwelling with my spirit. But God, I cannot wait till these eyes behold you face to face. I cannot wait to spend eternity looking upon the face of Jesus, the one that loved me enough to lay heaven aside and come to this earth and die for me. Doesn't make sense to me, but I'm so thankful that you did. God, if anyone in this room has not experienced the saving grace of the Jesus that we sing about today, I pray they wouldn't walk out those double doors until they have met their Savior. May today As the old timers always said, may today be the day of salvation for that individual. God, we feel your presence in this room. We love when you meet with us. We ask that you remain with us for the rest of the service. Father, bring power to pastor as he stands behind the sacred desk and brings forth your word. And I pray that our hearts and our ears would be open. God, we would receive your word and allow you to move and change us as you see fit. We'll give you all praise, honor, and glory for what you choose to do at Liberty today. In Jesus' name, amen.
there's no greater love than this You have overcome the grave Your glory fills the highest place What can separate me Well, amen. Thank you, Brother Bush, for that song. I was listening to the words, and my mind immediately went to John 15, 13, where it says, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did for us, amen, at the cross. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me just say a couple of things. First of all, it's good to be back home, amen. I enjoyed getting away, had a great time, got some rest, but there's no place like home. And I want to say a big thanks to Brother Copeland for... Uh, filling in for me really on pretty short notice. Uh, I was in the emergency room till about 3.30 uh, that night, uh, Sunday morning. And uh, with a little episode, I won't go into all the details, but I'm doing a lot better now, thank the Lord. So y'all just continue to pray for me and my health. But, and then Brother uh, uh, Hill preaching last Sunday. Uh, I don't, there's only been one other occasion that I've been gone two Sundays back to back, and that was when I had my, my surgery. And so uh, I don't like doing that, but I thank God that we've got good godly men that can stand behind this sacred desk and proclaim the word when uh, I must be away, uh, unforeseen or scheduled. I, I, I like knowing that y'all are in good hands, and I know that was the fact. I appreciate Brother Don stepping up and helping Brother Hill as well, and all of you for your faithfulness. Amen? Second Corinthians chapter 4, I want to talk to you about something this morning that is... Uh, it's something that really all of us deal with in our lives. I want to talk to you about discouragement. Do you often get excited about pursuing a goal and a dream, uh, going somewhere, uh, and then when the results don't happen the way you expected them to happen, uh, you get discouraged? You ever been there? I have. 
and I'm sure that all of us have. Do the negative opinions of others sap your energy? Uh, my wife and I have this term for people that oftentimes do that. We call them energy vampires <laughs> because they suck the energy right out of you by their negativity and things like that. And they take your enthusiasm away. Have you ever been there? I'll I, I tell you this. I was doing some, some statistics studies in preparation for this message. And believe it or not, the statistics are, are this. 95% of the population of the world deals with discouragement. Very little people would, would say, we don't have times of discouragement. 95% said, I deal with this. Discouragement, by the way, is one of the biggest obstacles we face in life. In fact, I believe that it's probably one of the devil's greatest tools, one of his most effective tools. Here's why. Discouragement causes us to falter in our faith. Discouragement causes us to focus on our failures and discouragement causes us to fear our future. Does that make sense to you? I thought about how it affected me and that's exactly what it is. It causes me to falter in my faith. It causes me to focus on my failures, which are many by the way, and it causes me to fear my future. And the truth is that being a Christian does not make us immune to times of discouragement. There's some super self-righteous, pious people out there that goes, I don't ever struggle with discouragement. Well, you're a liar. <laughs> because 95% admitted it and the other 5% are liars. <laughs> we all struggle with discouragement. We can even see this in the children of Israel. As you go back and, and read in the Old Testament, by the way, the Bible says that in that Old Testament, those things were recorded for us as examples to us. Don't ever think that the Old Testament is, is, is passe, it's long ago, far away, it doesn't have meaning to me because the whole point of the Old Testament is those stories, those things that God did with them have a great meaning to you and I and a lot of lessons there that we can learn if we'll spend time there. Numbers 21.4 says, And they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged, now listen to this, because of the way. The way. I thought about that right there. They were discouraged because of the way. And I thought, you know what? I found myself discouraged because of the way. Uh, think about this. It speaks of the way things are in life. It speaks of the way we wish things were in life. And when those things don't line up, there's discouragement there. And so it speaks to the difficulties that come to each of us in our lives every day. See, here's the time. The thing, we get discouraged at times we get discouraged because of the way. The way. And yet as I look at God's Word, I find God encourages us not to be discouraged. Amen? I find in God's Word promises that tells us we don't have to be discouraged in the way. And I want you with uh, me to look this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 because here we find God tells us not to faint and to faint not. And those two expressions literally mean don't lose heart. Don't quit. Don't be discouraged. And notice what it says in verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. It says, Therefore seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of His glorious gospel, the gospel of Christ, should sh the, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, amen, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That speaks of the bodies that we live in. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we 
which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore I have spoken, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, rebound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So what we find in this passage of Scripture right here is there are times when every person, every person faces difficulties in life. And, and this causes us to struggle. And this can cause us to be discouraged. And this can cause us to faint or to lose heart or to say, you know what, I just want to quit. I'm tired of the way. And therefore, I'm discouraged and I just want to quit. But what we also find in this passage, this wonderful passage, are words of encouragement given by the Apostle Paul, words of the Lord Jesus, that we're not to let these difficult times discourage us. We're not to let these difficult times get us down. We're not to let these difficult times get us to the point where we want to throw in the towel and quit. I want you to notice what Paul said we should do in order not to lose heart when life seems unbearable. Have you ever been there where life seems unbearable? I know that you have. I'll tell you what, we've gone through some things recently and it seemed in that moment that life was unbearable because we had no answers. We didn't know why. And there was nothing humanly speaking that we could do to change the circumstances that we were confronted with. And I tell you, in those situations, if you lean on yourself, you're going to get discouraged. The only place that you can turn is to God and trust Him. When you can't, it's been said, when you cannot trace His hand, you don't know what He's doing, you must trust His heart. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, For which cause we faint not. See, when Paul made that statement, understand this, he was not sitting on a beach of the Sea of Galilee drinking a whatever, we'll just say a Dr. Pepper, right? We won't say that, working on his tan. No, he was under uh, immense persecution, knee-deep in it. And he was experiencing literally day-to-day the threat that his life could be ended because of the people that were after him, the people that hated him. Now in the context of Paul's statement, we see first of all the unbearable things that were happening to him. Notice what he says in verse 8. Paul says, we're troubled on every side. If you're not having a mark in your Bible, I'm going to give you some key words right here. And I would underline them, maybe highlight them, but the word trouble is descriptive of grapes being crushed in a wine press. That's what they do. Now, they've got modern day means to crush these grapes, to press these grapes. In the old days, they would put them in this big vat and elderly women would would walk around with their bare feet, clean, hopefully, walk around and they were literally crushing the grapes. And so when Paul says right here, when he says, I'm troubled, that's what he's saying. It's like I'm being crushed. The weight of the world is pressing me down. And so Paul speaks of these troubles, and they're coming to him from every direction. Have you been there? It seems like every direction. Have you ever felt like that? It's like you're in a room and the four walls are closing in on you. That's exactly the way Paul felt. And Paul's describing here a time when his life Uh, felt like the way was extremely difficult for him. And he was feeling very discouraged because of it. I preached many times about the storms of life, and, and the Bible tells us that the storms of life come to all of us. I think about the disciples in the boat, and Jesus said, let us go over to the other side. But in the midst of that night, uh, a great storm came. Now Jesus is asleep in the hinder part of the ship, and yet in that, in that ship, they are confronted with a great storm. So much so that they go to the Lord Jesus and said, Master, do you not care that we are about to perish? They thought all hope was lost. They're dead meat, so to speak. 
And Jesus got up and of course calmed the sea and, and the wind and He said, Oh, ye of such little faith, how long am I going to be with you and all these things? And that's, that's the truth right there. And oftentimes that's the problem. These storms come to all of us and, and, and sometimes we forget that Jesus is in the boat. Amen? But then there's these other storms that come. I call them the perfect storms. And that's when it's not just one storm, but it's multiple storms coming from different directions, every direction. I think of the tornado in 1979 when all of those storms met together and literally uh, you've probably seen the big funnel cloud that was over a half mile wide, but what you don't see always there is there were actually three different tornadoes, three funnel clouds down and the debris was so broad and they were so close together that it looked like it was just one tornado when in reality it was three tornadoes. And maybe in your life you've been there where it's not just one thing, but it's multiple things coming at you. And so it's the perfect storm. And they come in this massive storm, I'm telling you, if you're not careful, it can discourage you. Because it's not one thing that you can set your mind and attention on. It's multiple things. See, there's no doubt the devil can orchestrate perfect storms. Do you know that? The Bible says he's the prince of the power of this air. And no doubt there's times, there's times when God... God can send storms. That's what He did to Jonah. The Bible says that God literally hurled a storm at Jonah because he was not following God's will. He was a rebellious child. He was a reluctant, wayward preacher. And God won't have that. And so God sent a storm. But oftentimes, the devil sends storms. And sometimes, storms just come as a part of life. And we, like even the wicked and the unsaved of this world, have to endure the storms. But then there's sometimes that those perfect storms come. That's what Paul talking about here. In fact, Paul went a little further and said that not only was he being crushed by the massive difficulties that had befallen him, but there seemed to be no way out. No way out. He seemed trapped. He seemed trapped. And we'll talk a little more about that in a minute. But notice what he said in verse 8. He said, troubled on every side. And then he says, perplexed. Perplexed speaks of a tight place with no way out of it. The word speaks at a a loss of what to do about what is happening. Have you ever been to a place, a situation in life where you had absolutely no clue of what to do about that situation? How to handle that situation? What do I do? Do I get on my knees or do I go mad? How do I handle this situation? Paul found himself in circumstances that had no exit. It had no escape. What, what happened to Paul? He didn't know what to do, and so he felt like there was no way out. And I began to do a word, a word study on these words here that he's given us, and when I began to read this, claustrophobia began to set in on me, literally, as I began to wrap my mind around what Paul was feeling. I'm claustrophobic. I mean, I don't mind heights. I'll get on the tallest building, whatever, but get me uh, underneath the house or get me in a tight cave where I feel like I'm not in control, and I will freak out. I don't want to, but I do. You go in the MRI? (laughs) Not me. Not unless that bad boy's open. Why? Because I get in that tight spot where I can't move and where I, I don't have control of the way out, and I begin to freak out. And a lot of people do that. You get in a situation where you don't see the exit. You don't see the escape. And that's where Paul found himself. And then in verse 9, notice what he adds here. He says, not only troubled on every side and perplexed, but persecuted. That speaks of being hunted down. It's like a hunter hunting his prey, an adversary that's coming after him constantly, relentlessly. I've told you this before. The devil's motto is persistence wears out resistance. He'll never stop. He'll never quit. Oh, He comes and offers you the deal. If you'll you'll capitulate, if you'll compromise, I'll back off, but He's a liar. And you give in and you do that, and He'll come after you even harder. Because what He wants is not for you to just be a little bit of a lukewarm Christian. He wants you destroyed. Verse 9, He says, cast down. That means thrown down and beaten, literally in the dirt. Face down, beaten, relentlessly. And so then Paul sums it all up and he's, what he's going through in verse number 10 where he says this, notice, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And he speaks of being delivered into death of, for Jesus' sake. And then in, and that's in verse 11. Then in verse 12, he speaks of how death worketh in us. 
Paul was simply stating that the threat of death, just like the Lord Jesus, he was being confronted with every single day. Every day he wondered, will I make it to the end of the day? Now I think about the things that I deal with and the things that you deal with, and there's not very many of us that wonder, will I make it to the end of the day? Life's not that bad yet. Oh, we, we have hope, you know what? Unless some unforeseen tragic accident happens, I'm in pretty good health, blah, 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 blah. I'm, there's a new day ahead of me tomorrow. Paul didn't know that to be true. He thought, you know what, I could, I could lose my life this afternoon. So we can understand Paul's pressures and problems. Reality, we do go through some of the same things. We have battles and, and burdens, right? We have fears and feelings. And those things can cause us to become greatly discouraged. I don't think any of us have experienced the difficulty to the degree that Paul experienced, but our trials and troubles are certainly in the same ballpark, are they not? And it's in those times when life can seem unbearable. Have you been there? I tell you, I've been there before. And yet it's in these circumstances that Paul said, we faint not. We faint not. And we do not lose heart. You might ask, well, how can that be, uh, Pastor? How can I keep myself from becoming discouraged? How can I keep myself from losing heart when so much stuff is happening to me? What do I do except get discouraged? I want you to notice not only the things that were happening to him, but notice the things that were happening in him. Go to verse number 16 again and notice what he says. For which cause we faint not, but though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. What Paul Paul had is a grip on God's providence. He knew that his life, in fact his very soul, was in the hand of Almighty God. And he knew that God had a purpose for everything that he went through. And he knew this. He could claim the same verse that he wrote over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Paul wrote that. And he said that God would cause all of these things to work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. And so that was a promise that Paul knew that he voiced to us over in the book of Romans. He understood that everything happening to him on the outside, listen to this friend, it was producing something in him on the inside. What God was doing was allowing the things on the outside to make Him something much better on the inside. What He said later was, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What was happening to Him on the inside was He's being transformed into the image and the mind of Jesus Christ. And as these things come to our life, if we handle them the way God would have us to handle them, on our knees in prayer and with the Word of God and with faithfulness to God's house, when we handle it like that, God begins to do something in us. And all of a sudden, those discouragement, those difficulties, those times where we wanted to throw the towel in, all of a sudden we begin to understand, you know what? They serve a purpose. An eternal purpose as we're going to see in just a moment. That's why he could say in verse number 8, notice it, We're troubled on every side, but not distressed. That's why he could say in verse 8, we're perplexed, but not in despair. That means without hope. Paul was hemmed in and pinned down, but not without hope. That's why he would say in verse 9, I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. He said in verse 9, I'm cast down, but I'm not destroyed. What was happening to Paul might bend him, but guess what? It would not break him. It would not break him. God was in control. That's why he could say in verse 14, here it is, knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus. What was he saying right there? The worst possible thing that these people can do to me, the worst thing that can befall me is I die. But guess what? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And guess what? That song, that last song we sang says that one day Jesus is coming back and we are going to be raised up incorruptible like Jesus. And the Bible says it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So what Paul's saying here, you know what? Kill me! For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen? 
Paul knew that even if his haters killed him, there was a better life ahead of him. Amen? Isn't that good to know? Even if the people that are uh, rocking your world, that boss, or that person down at the job, or that person down at the school, or that family member even, the worst thing they could do would be to kill you. Which would mean the best thing will happen to you if they did. That is, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Amen. Anybody saved here this morning? I'll tell you what, if you've not been saved, you're not giving your life to Christ, you can't go to that moment in time when you were confronted with your sin and you bent the knee and you repented of your sins and turned your heart and life to the Lord Jesus. You need to do that today because these promises, my friend, listen, life is bad oftentimes and sometimes for the, the saved and the unsaved. You can't escape that. It rains on the just and the unjust, but the promises of God are for the people of God. Amen? And so you need to know that. What was happening to Paul might bend him, but it would not break him. So Paul did not lose heart. Why? Because he found God's grace to be abundant, he says. Paul did not lose heart because he knew that God would get glory from what he was going for, going through, rather. Is that not what we live for to please God? Is that not what we live for to bring glory to God? Amen? But most of all, Paul did not lose heart because he knew that even though the outward man was troubled and perplexed and persecuted and cast down, there was something going on on the inside that God was doing that made this seem as just a light affliction as you read it in the Scripture there. It might look on the outside to some people, this is horrible what he's dealing with. But the truth of the matter is for the child of God inwardly, it's just a light affliction. Because God is at work. Amen? Even though there was no end in sight to what Paul was going through, he was experiencing something on the inside that seemed to say this is just for a moment. This is just for a moment. Brother Hill uh, played a video of Francis Chan preaching. And uh, I believe that's the video. I saw somebody, I think Ms. Kelly Gregg showed it. It was a video where he took the tape measure and illustrated the, the length of days, eternity, and basically, this is your life. This is your life. So many times we think that life is so long and life is so hard and so difficult. But friend, in, in light of eternity, life is so short. I, w- I was reading this week about uh, how uh, Buzz Aldrin and John Glenn and many of those astronauts were talking about in the next hundred years, we've got to find a way to, to get to Mars or we'll be er- the, the human species will be eradicated basically. And you know what, that sounds all fine and dandy, and I'm all for getting out into space and stuff like that, uh, but the truth is, you can't, you can't take God out of that equation. The, what we find is, is that our, God's plan for our lives is right here on earth, amen? And when we leave here, it's to be in heaven, amen? But they were talking about how long it would take to get to Mars and how we could have, we could have actually gone back in the 60s when we landed on the moon. But there was such a high risk of death because of the length, the length of time it would take. It was like 328 days just to get there one way. And of course, 90% of that, uh, that uh, atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And I mean, there's, there's like almost zero oxygen in the atmosphere of Mars. So what are you going to do about that? And they said, well, we could detonate nuclear weapons and it would release greenhouse gases and all, all the things they they are bad here on planet Earth. They say there would be good because it would create oxygen in the atmosphere. Anyway, I read all these articles, and they were talking about the time that it takes to travel in space and all these different things. And I thought, you know what? They, they're measuring things in terms of what they know as a human being and what science has uh, made available to them. But God, he, God rules and God speaks in terms of eternity. And when God talks about our life, He's not talking about us as this little small little speck on the the scale of time. God includes us in every facet in the, in the, uh, the, the view of eternity. And so when God thinks about the things that we must endure in this life, He he says, it's like Paul figured it out, it's just a moment. It's just a little speck on the scale of time. And then all eternity awaits us. For all eternity we will live in perfection and we will live with Jesus, amen? And so we ought to live this life, this little speck of time, not in light of our 60 or 70 or 80 or maybe 90 years, maybe 100 for someone, but we live it in light of eternity. 
And we don't get discouraged about the difficulties that we face on this little speck of time, but we live our lives knowing that there's a, there's a far greater weight and glory that, is, that, is, uh, that we're working for. He said a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory in verse number 17. So what is the message that Paul gives us this morning? Let me summarize it like this. It's going to take a lot more than adversity or affliction to stop me. Amen? And I'm not going to let my difficulties cause me to get discouraged and quit. Although there's times that I felt like that. Amen? Why? Because God is doing something in me that's working a far more exceeding and eternal weight in glory. Notice the second thing. Not only do, do we not lose heart when life seems unbearable, but secondly, we do not lose heart when your labors seem unfruitful. I want you to go over to Galatians chapter 6 if you would. I want to look at one more verse. One final verse that I want you to see. And it's, I, I love this verse. I claim this verse. I, I live by this verse. And you must know it, my friends. We don't get discouraged when life seems unbearable and we don't get discouraged when our labors seem unfruitful. And here's what Galatians 6, 9 says. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if what? We faint not. We faint not. In due season we shall reap our reward if we don't quit. If we don't get discouraged and go, you know what? You, you guys just have that and I'm going to go do my thing. We must be committed. We must be faithful. And we must do it even if it demands sacrifice. Why? Because it's working in us a far more greater and exceeding eternal weight and glory. That's what he says here. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, because in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Now there's, there's certain promises in the Bible that are a constant source of encouragement. But there's none quite like this promise in verse number 9, for me anyway. I'm speaking for myself here. Why, this precious promise is for all those that faithfully serve God. Notice I said those that faithfully serve God. God has a lot of things to say in the Scripture about being faithful, about being committed. Amen? And, and there's so many people today in this church age, which I would call the Laodicean church age, it's lukewarm. The, the people aren't hot and the people aren't cold. They're, they're just lukewarm. They've got just enough of Jesus to get them into heaven, but just enough of the world to make them miserable in life. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're straddling the proverbial spiritual fence, so to speak. One foot in the world and one foot in eternity. But friend, that's not going to bring joy to your life. That's not going to bring peace to your life. Why? Because God blesses those and this promise is for those who faithfully serve Him. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now wrap your minds around this with me and think first of all how the discouraged worker feels. I want you to think about this. Paul speaks, notice the words there in verse 9, of well-doing. Now let's break this down. The word well speaks of that which is valuable or virtuous. Literally, we could say the God stuff, okay? The word doing suggests that which is appointed to us, okay? It speaks not just of doing well in a general sense, but doing well in that which God has called us to do. So you understand there's a, 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 a general revelation that's called the Bible that's, that's for all of us. God's will in the general sense is for every one of us. It's the same. Jesus said, if you love me over in, in John chapter 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Here's the thing. There is also a divine will that is individual to each of us. Okay? There's a revelation that is particular for each and every one of us. Uh, every member of our church, every member of our church has been given a specific work that he or she is to perform in the body of Christ here at Liberty. You go, well, hold on a second. I come here, you preach, Brother Hill does the music, so-and-so teaches the Sunday school, and uh, I don't really do anything. Why is that? The Bible says that God places in the body of Christ those as He sees fit for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ and helping the work of Christ go forward. Nobody gets a free pass, my friends. We're not saved to sit. We're saved to serve. Amen? 
That's me, that's you, that's every one of us. If you're saved this morning, God has saved you and God has commissioned you with a purpose. Right here in the local church. And it's not this vague, ambiguous thing that nobody knows. It's very specific. And what you've got to do as you begin to live God's Word out, amen, as you begin to faithfully live God's Word out, God is going to show you then His specific will for your life. Okay? And let me just say this, because I believe this with all my heart. Some preacher might argue with me, but this is what I believe. I don't believe God's going to show you His particular will until you are faithfully doing His general will. Until you do the Bible faithfully, God's not going to show you a specific task. Why? What would be the point of having you know that He wants you to do this if you're not willing to do this? Amen? Are you with me this morning? Now in some cases, here's the thing. Some people feel like you're not really getting anywhere are not really getting anything done for the Lord. Now in some cases it's because, let's be honest, you're not doing anything for the Lord. (laughs) Okay? I love you. But let's be honest. You don't feel like you're doing anything for the Lord because you're not doing anything for the Lord. You should have been convicted about it, by the way, many, many times. If you're not, you need to pull that salvation policy out of the drawer and check it out. Because I'll tell you what, when I got saved, the first thing I, I did when I was made alive in Christ is I wanted to get busy serving. I wanted to get busy telling somebody about Jesus. And it's not one hour a week at, at uh, soul win and visitation. The Bible literally says, when it says, go ye therefore, it means as you go, do God's will. Share the gospel. I'm talking about those who are genuinely trying to serve God here this morning. In this area, He's called them to serve, but it seems that your service, your labor is not as effective as you wish it were. That's who I want to talk to. I'm not talking to them that, that aren't doing anything for God. I'm talking to them that are doing something for God, and yet you've come to a place where it seems like your labor is unfruitful. It seems that there's just not much bearing of fruit, and, and it's frustrating. You work, but it seems that nothing's really happening. You do your best and you give your best and, and it still seems like you're getting nowhere. Anybody ever been there? Hey, guilty. And here's the thing, you get tired and frustrated and you think maybe I'll just quit. Paul spoke of growing weary and well-doing in verse 9. Did you see it there? That word weary means, it's the same word faint over in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16. And he speaks here of losing heart of getting discouraged and then giving up. And it speaks of getting discouraged in your work because it seems that nothing's happening. And I'll tell you, I, I, my heart goes out to uh, pastors, not just because I am one, but I know, I know that feeling. It, it, you work your guts out, you study your heart out, you preach what you believe that God wants you to preach, and, and you do all these things, and it seems like there's no response. And, and, and God help you if you preach a message about faithfulness. Because the next week nobody will show up. It's like, I'll show him. And then there's this guy across town and, and it seems like everything he does turns to gold. And the numbers are there and, you know, they're having a big party for Jesus and over here we're just kind of eking along. I, I'll tell you folks, I've been there. And I used to get my... My, my eyes on the numbers and that was very frustrating and discouraging. And I began to question, God, am I the person that you want here doing this? Because it seems like there ought to be more. Then I realized, you know what? I don't need to get my eyes on numbers. I need to get my eyes on the Lord Jesus because He's at work. Thank God for the five precious souls that we've seen saved recently. And to God be the glory, amen. Some sow, some water, God gives the increase. God does the saving. I was thinking about this on vacation. You know, I think over the years we've been so familiar with salvation that we've kind of lost the thrill of what that means. Think about it like this, and this is what I was thinking about. If if everybody this morning got your bulletin, and in that bulletin was a check made out for a million dollars, 
and it was blank. All you had to do is write your name in it. Signed, Donald Trump. You know, he's got it, right? And everybody was, um, is this real? Yeah, it's real. And then he comes to the pulpit and says, here's the deal today, folks. One little child can get saved today if you're willing to give every one of those million dollar checks up. What would you do? Here's the thing, and this is what we forget. That one little soul is worth more than all those checks combined and a billion times more than those checks. One little soul You think about that. That one little child, that one person, that one adult, they are forever saved for all eternity. They'll never be in hell because they've accepted Christ at Liberty Baptist Church. They will forever be in heaven and forever in heaven if you had a part in that. Now, God gets the glory, but if you had a part in that, you get to see them for all eternity knowing, you know what? Praise Jesus that I was in that moment in time willingness to look beyond all this discouragement, all of the frustration, and just be faithful. Amen? What a, what a blessing it is when people get saved. But sometimes as a pastor, you know what? We go up here, uh, uh, I started out in ministry, in youth ministry, and man, we saw over 100 teenagers saved my first year in youth ministry. To God be the glory. Over 150 the second year. And I've never had a year like it either of those years since then. And I wonder, God, am I doing something wrong? And I get my eyes on the numbers. And I become discouraged. And I lose heart. And I want to throw in the towel. Paul says, let us not be weary in well-doing. I think of the teacher that works really hard on their Sunday school class. My 76-year-old mother-in-law, she has a little Sunday school class over at her church that she attends, Southwest Baptist. And she sacrificially, I mean, they're just paycheck to paycheck. They wonder how they're going to make house payments because they had to take out a loan just to survive because all they have is Social Security. And yet every week she sacrificially gives and buys things for those kids and puts crafts together. And yet I think you look at somebody doing that and, and then... It seems like sometimes the numbers aren't there. And they look at another teacher and it seems like, man, they're, they're busting out at the seams. And yet here I am and I'm getting nowhere. One worker wonders why another is so blessed and it seems that they're so barren. One works and works and yes, there's very little results. And there's a weary worker, a weary worker. A discouraged worker feels that he or she's a failure. There's been many times that I felt that way. And I know this. I know there's been times when you possibly have felt that way. The discouraged worker, we see how they feel. But I want you to notice the second and last thing this morning, what a devoted worker finds. If you're discouraged and you feel that you're getting nowhere, getting nothing done, I want you to listen to the promise of God. He says again, and let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, here it is, in due season we shall reap if we faint, God, faint not. God says to us not to lose heart if we, and for us to stay at the work. And if we're faithful, we will reap. Notice what he says, in due season. When shall we reap? In due season. Those two words are encouraging to me. Listen to this. As you study the words, the word due here speaks of a personal time of reaping. It speaks of one's own season. In other words, my season of reaping might be different than Brother Copeland's season of reaping. Amen? We both labor, and yet this might be his time to reap and not my time to reap. He says, you shall reap in due season. Due means your own season. The word season speaks of the proper time of reaping. Notice the seasons. He says there's coming a specific time that's specific for you in which you're going to reap. See, when we sow the seed in the field, there is a proper time for harvest. The the farmer doesn't just put the seed out there and when there begins to be little sproutlings, then he goes out there with the combine and harvests. No, that's not the due season. 
That's not the proper time of reaping. And you say, well, well, pastor, when is that? Only God knows that. Only God knows that. There's a personal time of reaping and a proper time for reaping. But listen, that's why we don't lose heart. Why? Because God has promised, if we don't faint, we will reap in due season. He says, don't lose heart because it seems that nothing's happening. Don't lose heart because you feel that you're not getting anywhere. Amen? So here's the question. Are you serving God? Are you doing what God has called you to do? Then stay at it. Stay at it. Don't lose heart. There's a reaping that's coming down the road. And it might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. But it's coming. Amen? It's just like the parent that raises their child. And when they're little, sometimes it's hard to be consistent and to be committed to faithfully, you know what? Have them in God's house and teach them God's Word and pray with them and discipline them, spanking if necessary. And and it's hard and you you don't want to be Mr. Bad Guy, but sometimes you must be in order to drive that wickedness out of them. And you do it, why? Because you hate them? No, but because you love them. But here's the deal. When you pay, when you pay the dues... Early on, you will reap in due season, my friend. And I'm not a perfect parent and my kids are still being raised. One's a grown man, but the other one's close. I'm almost to that, to that finish line with them so where I can say, you know what? It works to do it the way I did it. They're not in jail. They're not drinking. They're not doing drugs. They're not having sex outside of marriage. And so... I'm almost to that point where all those seeds that me and my wife planted, all the difficulty when we had to go go in the room and I'm coming in there and I'm going to wear you out. And it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. (laughs) No, it's not. But you know what? When they're two young men of integrity and character and they faithfully serve God, that's reaping season. Amen? And so many parents, they're so short-sighted, they don't see if they're willing when they're little to do right by them. And it's hard to be consistent and committed. I'm telling you, it is. But payday's coming. Amen? Payday's coming. The story's told when Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue that as he got uh, further and further away from the homeland, uh, those on the ship with him began to try to encourage him to turn back. There was so much uncertainty and a lot of fear. They had never been there. You remember back then they thought the earth was flat and they're just going to fall off the edge of it by sailing. At one point there came a time when it was so serious that the men were threatening mutiny on the ship. He persuaded them to sail on three more days. And if no land were incited, he said, then I'll change direction. It was on the morning of the third day that they spotted land. And here's what he said in his ship logs. Each day Columbus made this entry. He said, today we sailed, still no land in sight, but we sailed on. Day after day that same entry was there. Today we sailed, still no land in sight, but we sailed on. You know what, my friend, there may be no land in sight today, but we sail on. Amen? You keep your sails up and you keep going. And if listen, if tomorrow there's no land in sight, you keep sailing on. Amen? You keep preaching and you keep witnessing and you keep teaching and you keep telling the old, old story of those little boys and girls and you sail on, my friends, and you don't quit. Keep on keeping on and somewhere, listen, in the proper time and in the personal time, there's going to be a reaping. Land will be found. Amen? God's blessings are true. Amen? Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Revelation 22, 12, brother Hill alluded to Revelation. Jesus said, And behold, I come quickly. Amen and amen. And my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. Here's what we could say about that. Jesus says, I'm coming back. And I'm coming back very soon. Remember that time scale? Our life may seem so long, but friend, it's very short in in, in terms of God's, God's time scale. And Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. And when I come, every one of you that sowed, I promise you, you will reap. There are rewards that I'm bringing with me. And I'm going to give it to every man. And I'm going to give it to every woman. And I'm going to give it to every teenager, boy and girl, that served me. According to how His work shall be. Jesus is going to find us in that day. 
And I pray that He finds us with our hands to the plow. Amen? You know, the secret to plowing is this, and I'm not a plow boy. I've, I've been a little bit on a farm here and there and a ranch here and there, just enough to know I don't want to do it for a living. It's hard work. I was with a friend last night eating dinner, and he was talking about how he, he, he had to uh, spring, uh, stretch five strands of barbed wire all day long. I said, I remember doing that at my Uncle Nan's place. Don't want to do it. I was nice. I said, if you need some help, call me. And then I was going, dear Jesus, please help him not to call me. But, <laughs> but the thing about plowing is this, and here's how you do it right. Back in the old days, it was the mules or the oxen or whatever. But what you do is you set, you find you a place off in the distance and you put that old mule's ear right on that place and you don't look back and you don't look to the side. You just keep plowing forward. Keep looking at that spot off in the distance. And you have that, that basically that old, that old donkey, that old uh, mule, you got his ear lined up at that spot and it don't vary. It don't vary. And then when you get to the end of the row, when you turn around, what you're going to find is the row was straight. You see, those that keep turning around and looking, they're, they're plowing like this. They're plowing like that. With the, in the modern day, when you got a tractor, you just put the, the old John Deere logo that's sticking up out there on the end of that tractor, or the Ford, or whatever you have, the Kubota, and you put it out on that place off in the distance, and you just keep going, and you keep that lined up. You don't let it get off to the left, and you don't let it get off to the right. You just keep it going straight. And for the Christian, that's what we do. We look off in the distance, and we see Jesus. And we see Jesus coming back and we keep our eyes fixed upon the face of Jesus and we just keep plowing, amen? And the Bible says any man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And so we look forward and we look to Jesus. Why? Because I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. Amen and amen. So don't lose heart, my friend. Don't lose heart, my friend. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed.